I'm Nancy Yodelman, and this is my studio in Clovis, California. A couple of things I'd like to mention first is this is probably one of the most wonderful studio spaces I've ever had, and I've had quite a few. It was built in 2003 in September, and at the time, it was my husband at the time, who's an ex-husband and a very good friend to this day, was given these windows, um, all the, they're huge, and they're unbreakable glass. He was working at Clovis Community Hospital and they were tearing down a structure. And he got the idea to build the studio from the windows. And so it's 12 feet on this side, eight feet on the other side, but it's all north light which is the best light really for working in daylight because there's never any glare. And it's, it looks out onto my garden. I worked very hard at a certain time planting all sorts of things. Now I need help with it, but it's beautiful to be able to look out these windows. And I think it's an integral part of my artwork, having this space and being able to have the light and look outside. Nancy, can you tell us about the piece right behind you? Yes. Okay. This piece is from 2007, so it's a little while ago. How, how I, first of all, how I create the work. I work on these tables. They're a nice height for working. I had a party dress that I got at the Goodwill lay it out on the table, pad it with tissue paper, and then using that plaster gauze that you dip it in water, lay it down, then it, it sets up, becomes hard. And then a harder set of setting plaster over that to create this outside shape. So it's, it's um, very strong. And then over that, I put all kinds of stuff on it like, buttons and pins and bracelets and broken jewelry and just all sorts of stuff. And then that got coated with this thick acrylic texture paste. So it um, kind of transformed it, made it kind of into one unit. And then it's got layers of metallic paint brushed on from light to dark, dark to light, I'm sorry, dark to light. And then I added the spools of thread, but I love the colors. A lot of them are silk thread, which has a nice shine to it. And then that, that's what this piece needed. It really came alive when I added the threads. It makes the, the whole dress look like it's made out of metal. Is that your intent? Yes. Yes. I, I have the type of, you could call this faux bronze, the way I painted it to look like metal. I have done some work in metal. This is bronze and it's an edition of nine. I think this is, oh, this is an artist proof anyway. It was, um, a rubber mold was made from the original, which was, I had a tiny shoe someone had given me. A really, I mean, really um, like Victorian shoe. I covered the shoe with little twigs, all kinds of little twigs that I'd collected. And then um, a rubber mold was created of that, then a wax, it's, it's a labor intensive process. And then this was cast. What I loved about this shoe is the twigs were following the outside of the shoe, kind of decorating it, but also creating an interesting texture and they look like little tiny bones to me, very much. And all of my work is a lot about, well, the past, memories, things that are gone, but they're still here, <laughs> or gone and forgotten, but still here. It's really one of my favorite works. It's called Bronze Works. It's called Twig Shoe. Can you yes. show us some of the things you have where you have your story? Oh, yes. Your collection Let's of go things. through this one. Yes. Oh, well, first of all, pearls. I'm just 
really taken by pearl necklaces. These I get on eBay, and it's surprisingly inexpensive to get a, a big grouping of them. I, oh, and I was, you know, just look at this. I mean, this has a ribbon that I guess you tie, and it, anyway, I've been using them in artwork. And then if we look up on these shelves, Buttons have always been something that I like to use in my work. And you can see the thread in sorted by color by a really wonderful intern one summer. Um, and sewing, uh, sewing notions are something I really enjoy using. I think, you know, anything that especially women used and used their hands to create really fascinates me. Especially when I think, you know, these women are no longer here. Tell us about this piece right here, and I see it doesn't have any buttons or... Oh, buttons yes, or these, these were from the early 2000s, so about 2003. What it is, is I got the idea of clothing that would be like thrown on the floor and then covered with leaves. You know how when, because to me when leaves fall from trees, it's something very, very beautiful. And so what I did, um, these are oak leaves. In fact, they're pin oak. I collected them from the Fresno Art Museum. They have a beautiful oak tree and them. Anyway, on the, but they're very sturdy leaves. So they're glued on pretty much the same way I created the other forms. First, making a plaster base and then gluing the leaves on to an actual dress. As a dress, there's, if you can see it, there's sleeves up at the top, a collar. This is the tie and this is the skirt. So it's a little abstract, you know, how it's dresses from probably the 50s, like I used to wear that my mother used to make for me. And then here's a dress that's a little bit bigger. So they were dresses, and I also did shoes, which I think are right here. Let's see. I can see. That. But the idea is that somebody has gotten a dress and just kind of tossed it. Yes, and then it's like years later, it's covered with leaves. Yeah, see, I remember a piece you did when you were a student at Fresno State, and you were covered with leaves. Oh, myself, yes. They were photographs where I laid down and then I had friends dump leaves on top. And yes. <laughs> you never forget anything. I mean, that yeah. Part of your experience comes from yes. before. Yes. And I really, the original inspiration was from the beauty of fallen leaves, really. Do you think you thought about that college experience when you? We're dealing with well, this? I must have. I mean, I don't know if I, like, I don't, I mean, it was in there somewhere. It was in there, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's so nice to have someone who has a history of Fresno State who has gone on to Cal Arts and now is, is exhibiting internationally. Oh, yes. It's really, it's really a wonderful story. Thank you, Joyce. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I probably should have tried to get that four-year degree from Fresno State, <laughs> but well, you know, it was the, I started there in the mid sixties and Joyce was my teacher. I remember, have great memories of oh, I have your classes. Let's see if I can pick her up. Here, let me just set it, oops, one of them right here. This was, after my cousin died, she was a little older than me. Um, another cousin brought me boxes of her things and she had, this was a um, Princess Diana doll in the wedding dress. And I thought, you know, well, do I need another doll? Anyway, but I love, um, doing something with it. So what I did was 
wrap it with thread. These are these are actually dried gardenias that have been treated with, put on with glue, and then have encaustic over them. The whole thing's covered with encaustic. If you're wondering what encaustic is, it's beeswax that's been melted with Damar resin. And when it's melted together, it makes this um, really wonderful, um, what is it? Like I use it as a coating over things. You were um, taking uh, classes from Judy Chicago at Fresno State. Yes. Tell us how, how she, did she influence you? Oh, very much. In yes. Well, um, Judy Chicago decided um, to have a class for women only. And I remember she put up a notice in the hallway that said, Women, inter and you know, people didn't really call us women so much then. But anyway, it said women interested in taking a sculpture class. It said sculpture for women only. Sign up here. And so I thought, oh, I want to do that. But it, I, and she interviewed us. So we had to be interviewed, which was very unusual at the time. I mean, all of it to limit class by gender, to, um, but she felt, and it was true in a lot of ways, if there were men in the class, women would stay silent and defer to the men. They were there, you know, and if, if you went to a political meeting, the women were making the coffee and anyway. But, but so it, it was really great because right away she decided that we would, um, we would have our own studio off campus and so she stressed a lot of things that I think changed my life and stuck with me, which were, if you're an artist, you need a dedicated space to work. You need, you can take yourself seriously. If it's an idea, you get an idea, you work on it and you complete it. And her, or however, I mean, with me, sometimes I, the idea is, you know, it's a whole process. And then when it's complete, it's very satisfying, but um, yes. It, and then she also encouraged a group of us to apply to Cal Arts as art students. And, um, and so I did and was accepted. And I remember at the time it was, it was $2,000 a year. And that was like outrageously expensive, but I was able to qualify for a grant and a scholarship. But to live on, I worked three nights in the library and both days of the weekend is a fry cook in the school cafeteria and it was a dollar 35 an hour <laughs> and interesting you still remember those things i think you were very fortunate to take that first class from judy because that's totally unknown to have a, a class that meets off campus yes and to limit it to only women that's yes. against all of the rules yes so you fortunately being the first class Nobody knew what was going on. And oh, so yes. You could get, Judy could get by with it. Yes. Mm -hmm. And she left after that. She left teaching. I think she maybe could have stayed teaching. I have no idea. But she was hired at CalArts. And then she was only at CalArts a couple of years. And she was very ambitious and went you know, on her own path. But... It made such a difference in my life. I, I really believe, I have no idea what I would have been doing had I not taken that class from her. I don't know what I would have been doing. I don't think I would have moved to Los Angeles. Or... Mm -hmm. This is another bronze edition. This one is called Bound. It's an edition of nine altogether, but three were sold. And then this one, these need to be painted. These are going to be, to look at this picture. One of these is in the collection at SF MoMA, Good. which is wonderful. Bouquet, it's called. Now, is this in so, bronze or is this in? Oh, it's bronze. Yeah, if you try to pick it up, you'll know exactly. It's very heavy. You want to try to pick it up, Joyce? 
Yeah, yeah just yes. It is heavy. It's like a a, a roast beef. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I equate things to how would I would shop for food. This is one that I did. This is about my mother and her first marriage. So that's old photos. This is, you know, when you look back, I don't know if you, that you've had the experience when you see photos of your parents when they were young, before you were born, you, I kind of thought, you know, that's someone I do not know at all. You know, I knew her as someone who seemed kind of grouchy and <laughs> burdened and had four kids and, you know, was a wonderful cook. But this, she was living in New Orleans. You know, that dress, it's kind of very romantic. She was married for, it was just a year and a half. They were married and he died of a brain tumor. So it was something very tragic, but also very romantic. And it, it really, to me, relates to so much of what resonates in my work, especially when I see old photos, because there's always this sense of loss and tragedy there. And her husband's name was Tony. I did a lot of research on um, Ancestry.com, and I found a whole family tree. He was only 22 when he died. And they met, he, he was from New Orleans. My mother was born and grew up in Fresno. She was born in 1913 in the Armenian community. And she went to New Orleans. I was just told it was where she had her first job at the charity hospital. But why did she pick that? I mean, she probably could have worked anywhere. She was a registered nurse. And so they met, they got married, he died. Um, but you know, now that everybody's gone, there's so many questions I have that no one can really answer. You can look up and find facts, but you know, I, I was asking a really elderly aunt about Tony. What was he like? You know, she just she kept saying over and over, everybody liked him like that. You know, which is great, but what does that really say? <laughs> when you want to really know someone. Love letters that were written from 1928 to 1932. And it was, they were written by 39 different women all to the same man. Alan Watkins of Greensboro, North Carolina. The really amazing thing is when I bought them, I had no idea what I bought. It was just the listing said they were interesting letters. I started reading them and sorting them, and I was just blown away. And I put different piles, like some women only wrote three letters, some wrote 20, some wrote you know, whatever, but um, they were all love letters. These women had met him mostly at Virginia Beach, uh, a country club, Virginia Beach. And I even was able to get photos from the same man who, this is a photo taken by Alan Watkins. I don't really know if that's Betty Potter, who was one of the women, but I imagined in my mind that it was because it really, just everything about her, made me, th anyway, made me think that was her. But the letters all had kind of the same flavor. They would start out really happy and flirty and friendly, and then the tone would change, and it would be like, why haven't I heard from you? And they were kind of heartbroken. And one, Ellen Gilmore was her name. She only wrote three letters, but they were very to the point. One, you know, really, you could tell she was completely infatuated with them. Then why didn't you write back? And then the last one saying, please send back that photo I sent you because it means absolutely nothing to you. And just uh, anyway, but... Do um, you think these letters were all his collection? And they were his collection. 
And I talked to the antique dealer who I bought them from because he was able to get a lot of, this. he said that Alan Watkins never threw away anything. He lived to be it's either 94 or 97, but his house was packed. He said it was a virtual time capsule. He even had every car he ever bought. There were 11 cars. He had a huge property. He was a very wealthy man. It was nine and a half acres right next to a golf course and I don't know, 11 bathrooms or something, of, you know, just really, but it was packed full of everything. He's the antique dealer said his name was Lee Dowd. He told me he didn't think Alan kept him for sentimental reasons. He thought that Alan just never threw anything away. And he sold all this, the dealer got him after the guy's death and just sold stuff on eBay. Did Alan ever get married? Do you oh, know? Yes, oh, he, he did. did. He married a woman, not one of the letter writers in 1933, a woman named Elizabeth. And he had children. And I even talked to one of the sons, John A. Watkins. He told me they call him John A. Um, but he was shocked that he had no idea his father had all those romances. Do you have a show coming up? Well, yes, in October, or not October, I'm sorry, in September, a show in Oakland at the Fourth Wall Gallery. And it'll be in conjunction with Judy Chicago's retrospective at the De Young Museum. That was all supposed to happen last year. The retrospective for Judy and my exhibit, but it, of course it all got moved anyway. Yes, so um, I'm looking forward to that and I'll have a variety of works, some newer, some older. How many pieces do you think you can show there? Um, not more than a dozen mm -hmm. because it's not a very big space. But I'm just excited about the idea of getting back out in the world. In 2019, I had a lot of exhibits, including um, one in a group show at a, um, Heather James Gallery in New York City. So I was in Manhattan for a week and oh, it was wonderful. You know, mm -hmm. I never thought, I mean, whoever, who would who ever thought there'd be a pandemic and um, that things would change so much.